Down at 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. who walk the path in the unknown the ones who know the truth when it gets cold the ones who let the spirit mission control if you know you know let's go i'm on a spacewalk leap of faith life is full of days that don't feel safe but now i'm stepping out i'm not afraid hands up hands up we gonna elevate Six, five, four. it's so much to explore three two one we have a lift Good morning. Our wind shape team is here. <laughs> and we're going to hear a little bit about them. Hi, guys. Uh, so we are the Tur 2022 Turquoise team. Uh, my name is Elisha Webster, otherwise known as ICE. Um, and so I am the camp director for the summer. And this is my team. So I'll let them start over here. Hey guys, my name is Jordan Opat, and I'm from Anderson, South Carolina, and I go to Anderson University. Hey guys, my name is Jaden. I live in Pennsylvania, and I go to school at Liberty University. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Ethan Lowe, and I go to Valdosta State University in Valdosta, Georgia. Hi, I'm Margaret Stevens. I'm from Kentucky, and I go to Covenant College. Hi, I'm Ashley Johnson. I'm from Buford, Georgia, and I go to Emanuel College. I forgot to say where I was from. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> hey, guys. I'm Journey Hunter. I'm from North Georgia up in Young Harris, and I go to Manny University. Hi, my name is Olivia, but they call me Piv, and I go to FSU, and I'm from South Florida, or West Palm Beach. I'm Landry Carter, and I'm from Fayetteville, Georgia, and I go to Georgia Southern University. I'm Kira Spears. I'm from Virginia, and I go to Liberty University. I'm Nathan McDuffie. I go to um, Oglethorpe University, and I'm um, from Florida. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, I'm Isabella Kessler. I'm from Ellerslie, Georgia, and I go to school in Columbia New University International. Columbia International University. <laughs> Hi, my name is Marianne Swart. I live in Oregon, and I go to Biola University. Uh, my name is Mia Case, and I'm from Lafayette, Louisiana. My name's Shelby, and I'm from Warner Robins, Georgia. I'm Jesse Shalalo. I'm from Pennsylvania, and I go to Lancaster Bible College. My name is Caleb Fix. I'm from West Palm Beach, Florida, and I go to Palm Beach Atlantic University. Go Sailfish. Hello, I'm William Farthing. I'm from the South Kentucky, and I go to Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. Go Bibles. My name is Cade McCollum. I'm from Huntsville, Alabama, and I go to the University of Alabama at Huntsville. Um, my name is Davis. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas, and I go to the University of North Texas. Hey, y'all. I'm Camber Fillmorth. I'm from Kokomo, Indiana. Um, I go to school in Johnson University in Tennessee. Good morning. My name is Bree Barentine. I'm from Petrie City, Georgia, and I graduated from Troop McConnell University. Awesome. Hey, welcome team. We're glad you're here. You can hang on to that. I got one right here. Uh, I'm Jeff Bennett, and I serve at First United Methodist Church of Stewart. Hey, all right. It's kind of nice to be applauded. I like that. Hey, I appreciate those of you who ask about our vacation. We did have a wonderful time. Good to go and good to be home. Uh, so, good to be with you. We want to welcome those of you who are joining us online as well. We're glad that you are with us. And uh, hey, I wanted to highlight, uh, this is a really cool thing. Uh, our, our small groups and Sunday school classes, several of them got together medicines and medical supplies to ship to our Cuba sister church. And uh, these supplies made it down there in a record two weeks. And uh, we got this very nice note and pictures back. There they are opening these two uh, good-sized boxes. And there's a doctor in the congregation, Dr. Leo, and he uh, messaged me that uh, even as a medical doctor, this was the most medicine he had seen together in one place in a long time, uh, which kind of gives you a sense of the uh, uh, serious state in which um, our brothers and sisters in Christ in Cuba and the rest of that uh, country are. So uh, they distributed a lot of these meds um, Sunday before last, and they sent us this picture of thanks for, um, uh, for what um, uh, our, our groups did. And uh, talking to the team, you know, I think it would be good in, in a, when it's a little bit more time goes by, maybe you all, you know, the whole church would like to participate in just bringing in some uh, over-the-counter medicines and, and medical supplies. So keep that in mind, but we want to celebrate this uh, uh, joyous thing with our sister church. All right. Hey, I'm going to turn it over to Chrissy Stanley. She's going to highlight some announcements for us. Chrissy. Morning, church. I'm so happy to be here with you. Welcome to our guests. Um, if you're a guest with us and you're visiting, um, if you're online, you can click the link to fill out our Connect card. If you're um, in the church here, they're in the seat backs in front of you, and you can leave those in the offering plate um, after the service. Um, this week is wind shape. <laughs> Please be praying for our team, our volunteers, and especially, yep, the children and the youth who will serve. Um, we're partnering with Kiwanis Club this year again um, to cover half the cost of back to school tennis shoes for 122 Martin County children. Um, we have, um, if there's a display that you saw on the front. Um, if you grab an envelope from there and you put the money in there and then leave it in the offering plate, the money will get to where it's supposed to be. Um, we have fulfilled $1,437 of our $2,200 goal. So and today is the last day to give. So. Um, help those kids. Um, you're also invited to the church picnic. It is next Sunday at Hal Patioke Park at 5 p.m. Um, the church is going to provide the meat and the beverages, and you guys can bring sides and desserts. Come watch me beat Tom Green in cornhole. All right. <laughs> now, once you stand and greet your neighbors. <laughs>
Won't you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you have blessed us with. Some people are not so blessed, and we lift them up to you. Lord, we continue to pray for those suffering from the effects of the Ukraine war. We pray for peace for those displaced by the war, but also we pray that you might soften the hearts of the Russian leaders. Lord, thank you for delivering the medical supplies to our Cubic Sister Church. We are so grateful for the generosity of the people in our church family. Bless those who have provided the meds that, that were in need. God, we ask for blessings for those who invested in the kingdom, in the work of the kingdom. We lift up the Windshape team, give them strength throughout the week to pour into the kids that they will be serving. Lord, I pray all of this in the precious name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we're receiving the weekly offering in different ways. If you're worshiping in person, of course, you have the option of putting your gift in the offering plates on your way or in or on your way out on any Sunday morning. And then alternate ways to give may be found on our Facebook page and our web page. Now, hear this word from 2 Corinthians, this is from chapter 9. The point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. All right, kids, come on down for, uh, for children's time. something up here with me today. I thought you guys might want, might want to see this beautiful blanket. Yes, do you know what this is called? When they put it together, yes, Delaney said, I took that from her. Yes, I did. <laughs> so this was actually made by people in this church and given to us when Delaney was baptized. So it's a very beautiful quilt, and we have some quilters that put these together. And I was thinking about making one of these. Do you think this is easy to do? No, probably not, right? And do you think maybe if I just got a couple pieces of material and put them together just, you know, or even threw them up in the air or just kind of tied them together. Do you think I might be able to get a quilt? No? Does that sound pretty silly? I know you guys are looking at me like it's very silly. So probably won't happen. And you know what? I'm not really good at sewing. We probably have to do a little sewing, right? What else do you think happens? What do they do to get this together? Have you ever created something yourself and you had to get materials together? Yeah. Maybe collect what you're doing. Maybe scissors? Do you think they might have need, needed scissors? Yeah. And string, yarn, or not yarn, but string. And maybe a sewing machine, maybe not. They might have done it without that. But they probably thought it out too. Do you think someone drew this somewhere or had it in their mind how they were gonna create this? Or do you think they just thought, oh, I'm just going to put this piece next to this piece next to this piece. It looks like it was really thought out to me. It's got a good design, right? So somebody had to think about that too. So I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know, God creates each one of us. 
And do you think that he spends some time thinking about that? So are you the same as her or as him? Not the same, right? You're a little bit different. So there's probably different things in your personality. We have different hair colors. We have different eye colors. So we recreated differently, but God really took the time to think about that and knew us before anyone else did, right? Even before your mom and your dad met you. And so he really spent some time creating us. And there is a Bible verse, the, sh the first Bible verse, the shorter one. We are God's creation. He created us to belong to Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2.10. So we are God's creation. Thought about that. Any okay, can you hear me? Okay. And he thought about that when he put us, made us, and created us, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's another memory verse that she's going to share with us, too. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope in a future, Jeremiah 29, 11. So he really thought about the plans that he has for us, too. So there's things we can do after we're created so we can help Jesus. So when we accept Jesus into our heart, those bits and pieces, they get put together into a wonderful workmanship, and he can use us to share his love with others. All right, will you pray with me? Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for loving us and for creating us. And help us to share that love with others. Amen. Well, this morning I have a message before the message. It's, um, you may have read in Monday's Stewart News uh, or elsewhere that 106 of our Florida Conference 550 plus churches have sued to exit the denomination. And I wanted to talk for a couple of minutes about that. Uh, in Friday's weekly email, if you want more details, you look at last Friday's uh, email, and we have links to a news article, an FAQ document, a letter from our bishop in response to the suit. And in fact, we have copies of that letter if you, wanna, if you want one. Uh, they're on the back ledge out in the foyer. Uh, you're welcome to it. Uh, now, uh, some of the 106 churches have openly shared their concerns uh, with United Methodist Church on matters involving our LGBTQ members uh, and, and the desire to allow marriage and ordination in the life of the church. Yet the United Methodist Church's rules have not changed uh, on, on these matters. And in fact, uh, they can only be changed by the General Conference, which does not meet again until 2024. The lawsuit focuses on the process on which churches can disaffiliate with the annual conference uh, today. And it's my sense that the key objection is the financial obligation that goes along with disaffiliation. And by far the largest of those obligations is that departing churches pay a fair share of the conference's pension liabilities. Now, simply out of curiosity, I, I was in touch with the conference treasurer to ask, well, if First United Methodist Church would, would choose to disaffiliate, what would our uh, pro rata share of the conference liabilities be? And uh, the, the number is a jaw-dropping $465,000. So, so I understand the complaint of congregations that simply want to leave. And I understand the unfairness of saddling the remaining churches with the pension obligation of, of those wanting to leave. Now, I don't have a crystal ball that shows me what the 2024 General Conference, uh, how that will play out with respect to matters of, of human sexuality. But I will say this, while I consider myself a traditionalist in these things, 
If the United Methodist Church were to move to a more progressive position, I'm still in. I'm still in. And it's not because I'm compliant. Um, You know, one of the challenges of if you uh, just kind of go along to get along, but you're not really on board, that, that really can lead to bitterness. Like, yeah, well, I'll do it, but I won't like it. No, my choice to remain part of the United Methodist Church is, is, well, it's really my choice to submit to Christ. I'm submitting to Christ whose church this is. It seems like too easily Christians become divided along the fault lines of their culture. And you can name the points of division as well as I can. Uh, issues surrounding abortion, guns, immigration, vaccines, masks, race, climate, uh, the economy, gender, anything having to do with politics. And and the issues are not unimportant, but for us, they are not the main thing. You know, conversation around human sexuality is important, but it's not the main thing. What is the main thing? Love God, love your neighbor. And those two, which is often called the, uh, the, 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 the great commandment, uh, they lead us to uh, share the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, uh, and, and they move us to, to, well, what was the great commission? To go and make disciples. Can we not be one church, even as we figure out what it means to love God and love our neighbor? John 17, Jesus prays that we would all be one. Well, I'm praying that Jesus' prayer will be realized among us in in this corner of God's kingdom, in this church, in this congregation. Despite our our, our differing opinions on so many things, surely it is possible for us to remain united in Christ. You know, when we refer to our church among ourselves, we often use shorthand like... um, F-U-M-C or, or, or First U-M-C, but I might just start referring to us as First United. First United, just as a, a reminder that, 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 that God calls us to be united in Christ, and this is our first priority. Our priority isn't to agree on everything. It is to be one in Christ. First United. Let me lead us in, in a prayer about this. Oh God, we humbly acknowledge that we will not all agree on any single social issue we face as a community, as a state, as a nation. Yet we ask that by your spirit, you would make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. May we be first united for the sake of our witness to who you are. May we be first united as a people who invest generously in your work in the world. Help us to keep the main thing the main thing, focusing on your call to love you, to love our neighbor, to share the good news about Jesus by our words and by what we do, making disciples of Jesus Christ. And all the people said, amen. All right, so that was the message before the message. And, and I know you were probably feel you were at some risk since it was um, the last three Sundays someone else preached here, like, oh gosh, he may go on for an hour because he hasn't been up uh, front. Well, no worries. Uh, as we left things, um, well, last summer we were introduced to the first king of Israel. Anybody can tell me who the first king of Israel was? Saul, that's right, King Saul. So as we left things in 1 Samuel chapter 15, we saw Saul disobey God uh, in a big way. God decides to remove Saul from his position as king over Israel. And the prophet Samuel is heartbroken. Well, today we find Samuel dwelling on what might have been while God is looking forward to the future. This morning's reading comes from 1 Samuel chapter 16. It's just the first 13 verses. Uh, Please listen as I read. Uh, You might want to follow along on the screens or on your Bible app or, uh, oh, even the um, ink and paper Bible. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. 
for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see, they look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading the hearing of his word. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, I love imagining this story. And it's because I find it amusing, uh, particularly this part where where. Jesse has his sons parade in front of Samuel. You know, it's kind of like, a, like a, a, a beauty pageant, the way that I read it. You know, first up, we have uh, the eldest son, uh, Eliab. Well, and we assume he's the eldest because so many things birth order had to do with. Like if you were the oldest in the family, uh, you got a double share of the inheritance, uh, compared to the siblings on down the line. I've always been rather enamored of that as I am the oldest of five. Uh, so, you know, maybe there's number one because he's the oldest. Uh, and, and we're guessing because of what uh, the Lord says that he was also, you know, handsome and good looking. So uh, I, I just kind of assume he's kind of like sashaying down there, you know, with great confidence in front of Samuel. And, uh, uh, the Lord talks to Samuel and says, you know, no. Um, Samuel, sure, this is the one. Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Well, then Jesse calls Abinadab, you know, and again, I could just see Abinadab you know, just kind of strutting there beyond Samuel. And no, no, he's not the one either. And then comes uh, Shama, which is short for Shamalama Ding Dong. <laughs> this is not true. I was just seeing if you were still awake, okay? So, you know, again, Shama, just waltzing by. Not the one, not the one. And then, let's say one, two, three, contestant number four doesn't even get named, right, in the, in the Bible story. Test at number four, does the little uh, runway walk, and um, nope, not the one. And then contestant number five, uh-uh. Then number six, mm, no. Number seven, goodbye. So Jesse has made seven of his sons pass in front of Samuel. Seven. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord's not chosen any of these. Are all your sons here? And Jesse said, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. 
And Samuel says to Jesse, look, send for him because we're not going on. You know, we're not going to sit down and enjoy the meal until he has come. So Jesse sends for him, brings him. And then he's described, he says, now uh, he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. Appearance may not be what counts for God's choice, but, but the text seems to delight in saying that, hey, he could be handsome anyway. Now, I, I was thinking to myself, maybe it would have been more powerful if it had read, now he was ruddy and had crooked eyes and uh, was but ugly. But it doesn't say that way, so we're going to go with how the story reads. Uh, but apparently, you know, what we look like, whether we are handsome, you know, beautiful, according to whatever the culture standard is at the time, or just your average Joe or, or Jolene, this is of no importance to God. About David, the Lord says, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. So once again, we have a story that reminds us of the unlikely vessels of God's grace. Again and again in the Bible, God chooses people that you would not think God would choose to be God's blessing to others. Uh, today, God's choice is David, right? A shepherd, an eighth son from the village of Bethlehem, which is not some big famous city. It's this little town uh, from a family with no obvious pedigree. I mean, who'd have thunk? The theme of David as an unlikely instrument for Israel's hope, uh, that continues to the story of David's early years. Uh, next week is the story of a contest between David and the experienced warrior giant of a man, Goliath. Perhaps you have heard this story. Yeah, well, spoiler alert if you haven't. Uh, David is the highly unlikely champion in that contest. As unlikely a choice as David is, the text says, Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Now, a couple minutes ago, I, I spoke about the lawsuit, you know, brought by 160 United Methodist congregations against the Florida Conference of the United Methodist Church, and, and, and the issue is around human sexuality, in particular, same-sex marriage, and the ordination of those practicing uh, homosexuality, both of which are presently not permitted in the United Methodist Church. Now, I said at the outset said that when it, when it comes to matters of human sexuality, I'm, I'm a traditionalist. Yet this choice of David has got me wondering. It got me wondering about the exclusion of gay people from orientation, uh, or, or ordination, rather. Seems to me that God chooses whom God chooses according to God's purposes. I mean, God sees possibilities even when others do not. You jump ahead to the New Testament and we read Paul, of all people, write to the church at Corinth. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28. So, I'm having doubts about efforts to try to keep God from calling the wrong person. Because we're all the wrong person. Uh, in the sense that we're all flawed, we're all damaged by sin, uh, our own and what we've inherited from our forebears all the way back to the first man and the first woman. Yet imperfect people are the ones whom God calls. And I suppose that's because that's the only kind of people God has. Even David, uh, who's later described as a man after God's own heart, falls short. As king, David has an affair with Uriah's wife Bathsheba, and when she turns up pregnant, David arranges to have Uriah killed in battle. He's like, hello. Now, I know a lot of pastors, but I have yet to meet a perfect one. 
Yeah, the one I see in the mirror, certainly not perfect. Uh, I've been following Jesus for a long time, and yet from time to time, I, I, I still, I uh, uncover some sin, sometimes it's an attitude or kind of a, a, a way that, that maybe I've had all along, but I just finally recognized, and then, you know, I got to take steps, right? And often with the, uh, the help of people praying for me, um, to, to, so I can continue to become more Christ-like. I mean, that's, that's the aim of our journey, you know, that we become more and more like Jesus. Uh, this is a um, Methodist understanding of sanctification, you know. It, it's, it's typically a process. We're all going on to full Christian maturity. Yeah, so God's still working on me. Anybody else in that boat? Yeah, okay, good, good. We're on the same page. So, still not wholly mature as a Christian, but on the way. Yet, 27 years ago, the bishop laid hands on me and ordained me as a United Methodist minister. And, and as, as things presently stand in the United Methodist Church, it's not, not supposed to happen uh, for practicing gay or lesbian people. So this imperfect ordained minister is beginning to question that prohibition. I mean, maybe God is calling imperfect people of all stripes to this kind of ministry as well as to other kinds of ministry. And I suppose at this point some of you are thinking, well, of course, you slow idiot, um, you know, because some of you have been in that place for a long time. And others of you are thinking, heresy, heresy, you don't go there, Pastor Jeff. Well. I'm praying that God will bless us to be first united, even as we work out uh, where, what is God is doing in the world, what God is wanting to do in the world. Well, lastly, let me say that we do have this tendency, like Samuel, to confuse appearance with reality. And, you know, we live in a culture that, that for decades now has been oriented to image and appearance. And we've talked about this before, you know, like products are sold by the appearance of youth and sensuality, which have nothing to do with the product itself. You know, it's one thing, it's a line of beauty products, but, you know, you see this marketing cars. It's like, well, how does that make a difference, how a beautiful person looks in the car uh, when, when it's about what the car does and how it does it? God's word to Samuel, people look on the outward appearance but the Lord looks on the heart. That is hopeful. That is a hopeful word. With, when so many are fooled by appearances, it's comforting and encouraging to hear that God looks on the heart. It's comforting and encouraging to hear that God can see past this preoccupation with image and appearance. If the church is going to discern God's grace in the world, if the church is going to be a conduit of God's grace, then it too must seek to look at the heart, to see as God sees. If we succumb to the temptation to choose for appearance alone, God will call us out on it, same as he did Samuel. Now, <laughs> I had a little bit of fun with the irony of David being a handsome fellow after God said that it was the heart that mattered. But the text does not argue against our effort to make ourselves, our communities, our programs attractive. I mean, those who came before us, they built this beautiful sanctuary. And we work hard to bring a, a high caliber of music to our worship. And, and Lord knows the preacher wants to bring his best. We want our fellowship and our discipleship offerings to be first rate, to be winsome. And there's a value to all of that. But appearance is no substitute for matters of the heart. This is why we take so seriously our efforts to be for our community, to be for Stewart, from, from Manna Kitchen and Mission House to Family Promise and Back to School Shoes for Kids to Vacation Bible School and Wind Shape uh, to Adopt a Street and the Blood Mobile and, and a raft of other ways through which we express our love and God's love for our community. It, it, it's not be attractive or love those whom God loves. 
But it is a question of priorities. Ironically, the most beautiful thing about any church isn't its architecture, it isn't the harmony of the choir, oh, it, 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 it isn't the quality of the coffee. <laughs> the most beautiful thing about the church is the grace of God expressed through our love for each other and through our love for the world around us. The grace of God within will often show an attractive face to the world. May it be so among us. Let's pray. Well, Lord, we're excited to uh, get into this series where we walk with David through um, the adventures of his life. Lord, we're, we're heartbroken along with Samuel about Saul, who is now on the decline and uh, yet excited for the next chapter uh, where David will rise to become king over Israel. Lord, we pray that you will continue to teach us story by story uh, what we might apply to our own lives, what we might apply to our life together as the church. Lord, we pray that you will always give us a keen eye and a keen ear, spirits that are open to what you are doing in the world and what you are desiring to do and how you are inviting us to be a part of that. Lord, bless us not to put appearance first. Lord, bless us to put a heart for God first. Lord, bless us to put our love for our neighbor um, right up there with our love for you. Lord, bless us to be the people through whom you express your love to others. Lord, bless us as we seek to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ through what we say, uh, through sharing the good news, and through what we do as we seek to live out the good news for the sake of our world that is so desperately in need of your love, Lord. We ask it all in the name of and to the glory of Christ. Amen. Our altar is open as we sing our closing song. If you'd like to come and share a word of uh, prayer about something we talked about today or something that's just on your heart, you're welcome to come. Please stand.
And now as we prepare to leave this place, let us go with the hope of Christ in our hearts. Let us go with arms outstretched wide, uh, just as the Father's arms are outstretched for us. Lord, let us share the good news of God's love with all. Go now in peace. Amen.